Good morning, this is Chair Peter Fisher. Pursuant to House Rule 10.01, I call this remote meeting of the Behavioral Health Policy Division to order. The clerk will take the roll for attendance. Morning, Fisher. Fisher, present. Frederick, excused. Frankie. Frankie, present. Backer. Let's see, Backer. I have it unmuted and I am present. Thank you there, Spencer. Wonderful. Baker. <laughs> Seen him join yet? Baker. Uh, Becker Finn, excused. Hanson. Hanson, present. Uh, Katiza Watoon. Present. Lippert. Lippert, present. Moeller. Present. Pearson. Pearson present. Thompson. Thompson, Thompson. present. <laughs> Thank you, Representative. Uh, Mr. Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you, Mr. Cross. Seeing we have quorum, the next item on our agenda will be approval of the minutes. Uh, is there are there any questions or changes for the minutes as they were sent out? Hearing none, Representative Frankie, would you like to move the minutes from uh, March 23rd? Mr. Chair, I make a motion to move the minutes for March 23rd. Representative Frankie makes a motion to approve the minutes for March 23rd. Please unmute, this will be a voice vote. All in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion prevails and the minutes are approved. Members, thank you for being here today. I know that everyone's been busy the last couple of weeks with uh, deadlines. And we're gonna get started this morning with a presentation from Attorney General Keith Ellenson and his team on the opioid settlement. They've been working very hard on this. And then after that, we'll be hearing from Representatives Olson and Baker about the bill that they have going. So at this point in time, I'd like to welcome Attorney General Ellison to the committee. I appreciate you being here and would like to turn the uh, time over to you for your presentation. I know you've also got a couple of testifiers. Uh, Mr. Attorney General, if you'd like to introduce yourself and start your presentation, please. Mr. Chair, thank you so much. Really, I want to thank you, Chair Fisher, Vice Chair Frederick, Ranking Member Frank, thank you and all members uh, for the, uh, the time. Uh, I want to thank you all for the opportunity to address uh, House File uh, 4265. There's no question, if you look at the numbers alone, Minnesota families have been hit hard, devastated by this opioid epidemic. In Minnesota, 5,500 people have lost their lives to this crisis since uh, the year 2000. The crisis is not slowing down. The highest number of deaths in a single year came in 2020 with 678 deaths in that year alone. That number represents a 60% increase in opioid-related deaths over the last uh, over the year before. The crisis hits every corner of our state: urban, suburban, exurban, small town, rural. No community is immune. All have effect, been affected. Now, let me also note that there are people here, people behind these numbers. I can run numbers, but the numbers don't tell the human story. I met a lady in Arden Hills who told me that in 2012, her daughter was prescribed a small amount of opioids to relieve her back pain and additional opioids after surgery to remove her cancerous tumor. She quickly built up a tolerance and became addicted and needed to take more and more opioids just to relieve, just to achieve any pain relief. She suffered this addiction for years before overdose dosing on morphine in 2015. Members, I'm gonna allow my staff to go into the specifics, but I just wanna say that it is important that the Minnesota State Legislature took action early. That action was led by legislators who know what they're talking about and did a great job. They specifically set up a law which dedicates opioid settlement funds to opioid abatement rather than transferring them to the general fund as is typically required in settlements in states when the state reaches those. Of settlements. It also established the Opioid Epidemic Response Advisory Council known as ORAC to oversee the spending. I thank you all for having the foresight to do this. Now, here we are at a final step. 
The final step is House File 4265, which will enact changes to the 2019 statute that are needed so that Minnesota can achieve the maximum share under these settlements and the $300 million that are uh, ready to flow to Minnesota communities where this money is desperately needed. In fact, I can assure you it's not really enough to abate the crisis, but it is a, but it is a substantial down payment. Uh, I wanna thank Liz Olson. I wanna thank bill author, Rep Dave Baker. I wanna thank uh, chair, uh, the, who's also the chair of the OREC uh, for their diligence. Uh, Representative Olson and Baker have truly defined what it means to be a public servant in my view. Uh, and I'm certain every member of this house without exception recognizes how Representative Baker turned what was a terrible tragic loss uh, of his son to the opioid crisis into uh, what I believe is a heroic effort to save Minnesota families. Uh, now I wanna ask uh, members of my staff to talk to you about the details of the settlement. At the end of the day, what we're asking you to do is to pass this bill, which will help quiet claims. We have reached out to every county and city in the state of Minnesota and all have agreed. We have a 25, 75% split, 25 to the state, 75 to local communities because the money should go where the pain is. Uh, and uh, they're going to lay out the details of why quieting claims for any future folks who jump up uh, is important because if we don't, it will actually diminish the amount of money the state of Minnesota will be able to get. And with the scheme we have, we have laid out uh, a, a, a system where everybody can expect to get the maximum amount of relief that they need to abate this crisis. So with that, I'm gonna ask Assistant Attorney General uh, Evan Romanoff and Eric Maloney to walk you through some of the details of the bill. These attorneys have been doing this full time every day since 2016. Nobody in the state of Minnesota, in my view, knows more about it than them. And so with that, Mr. Chair, I will uh, yield uh, and allow those gentlemen to give greater detail. Thank you, uh, Attorney General Ellison. Uh, next, we will have, I believe it's uh, uh, Assistant Attorney General Evan Romanoff, if you'd like to introduce yourself and start the presentation. Good morning. Uh, this is Evan Romanoff. Can you hear me? We can hear you just fine, sir. Thank you. Okay. Apologies. I just got kicked out for about half a second. So thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair Fisher, members of the committee. I'm Evan Romanoff, as Attorney General Ellison mentioned. I'm one of the Assistant Attorneys General who was assigned back in 2016 to handle these opioid-related matters for the state uh, under Attorney General Lori Swanson. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you especially to the bill author, Representative Olson, and co-author, Representative Baker, for all your hard work uh, on this matter, uh, including co-authors, uh, Representative Cagle and Representative Becker Finn as well. So my job here today is really just to provide some background on the two most recent opioid settlements, and then the agreement that the state reached with our cities and counties to implement those settlements here in Minnesota. And then I'm gonna pass it to my colleague, Eric Maloney, who's gonna go into a little more detail on the legislation. Uh, Eric's got control of the slides. So I'll ask Eric to go to the next one, please. Thank you. So the state of Minnesota, we've been investigating opioid companies uh, throughout this supply chain, including manufacturers, distributors, consultants, pharmacy chains, and others for, for several years now related to their role in uh, basically creating and fueling the opioid epidemic. Uh, we've sued a couple opioid manufacturers and settled with several additional ones over the last several years. And uh, that leads up to why we're here today. The couple most recent uh, national settlements that are relevant really for this bill are the settlements with the three largest distributors, McKesson, Cardinal Health, and Amerisource Bergen, and opioid manufacturer Johnson & Johnson. So the total dollar value you can see on this slide here from these settlements is $26 billion, uh, of which Minnesota is set to receive more than $300 million paid over an 18 year time period. The vast majority of which you can see here is designated to opioid abatement. The state joined these settlements back in the summer uh, of 2021, uh, so about August, I believe. And into the, over the fall and into the winter, cities and counties in the state have been steadily joining on to the settlements. Under the default terms of the settlement, you can see here the allocation structure would have provided 85% of the funds to 
the state and only 15% to local governments. Um, however, thankfully, the settlements provide a large amount of flexibility for, this, for each state to sort of implement our own structure within the state and how funds are allocated and distributed. And you can see here that we reached an agreement to diverge from that, from that uh, default. Uh, I'll discuss in a second. Next slide, please. So financially, the settlements are designed to achieve what's called global peace for the companies. In, in other words, full resolution of both existing claims and potential future claims from cities and counties. Essentially what that means for us is that the more cities and counties that join the settlements, the more money the state gets and the more money that cities and counties will get to combat the opioid epidemic. So how to achieve this global peace? There's a couple pathways you can see we listed here on the bottom of the slide. One is through local governments signing on to the settlements or agreeing to release their claims or and potential claims against the companies. And then a second pathway is, is legislative or a statutory claims bar, which is in front of you here, uh, and which Eric is gonna go into a little more detail on uh, during his presentation. Next slide, please, Eric. Thanks. So we've really always had two goals our office has uh, with these settlements. And that the first was to maximize the amount of funds that got to the state uh, uh, for opioid abatement, meaning earning the most amount of money possible under the settlement, so up to a little over $300 million. And the second was to make sure that that money goes to where it's needed most. Uh, to achieve those goals, we knew it was vital to work with a lot of different stakeholders in reaching an agreement on diverging from that default structure that I mentioned. So we worked with all the, the parties you can see here. I'm not going to list them all. You can read them. Um, but we worked with all of those parties convening a couple different work groups over the last several months, which met uh, on a weekly, sometimes daily basis cre to create framework under which settlement dollars are going to flow in, in the state. Next slide. So the end result of all those meetings is what you can see here, the Minnesota State Subdivision Memorandum of Agreement. And this slide kind of highlights, uh, provides some of the highlights of that uh, agreement, although obviously it doesn't get into all the details. Uh, you'll recall I mentioned the default allocation structure under the settlements was 85% of the funds go to the state and only 15% go to the local governments. Where we ended up was actually quite the opposite of that, where local governments are going to get 75% of the settlement funds directly, including all counties and, and the eligible cities that are listed here. And then the remaining 25% goes to the state uh, to be overseen by the Opioid Epidemic Response Advisory Council and, and spent on opioid abatement. Uh, you'll see a note here that the bill that's in front of you is actually necessary to codify that 75-25 split, and Eric will provide a little more detail on how that's gonna work. So the second important part of this, this state subdivision agreement we reached is how the funds are actually gonna be used. And one of the work groups I mentioned was an expert panel of, of public health and, and treatment experts, which uh, had, uh, one of its purposes was to design a comprehensive list of approved programs uh, that's, that cities, counties, and the state could use to spend opioid abatement resources. It did. It ended up with coming up with a 13 plus non exclusive, a 13 plus page non exclusive list of programs and strategies that we incorporated directly into our agreement, uh, sort of a menu from which cities, counties, and the state can choose to spend their abatement dollars. Next slide. So this agreement you'll see here was finalized in, in early to mid-December and we circulated it to all cities and counties throughout the state and, and they had until January 26 to join, which we urged them to do. Uh, we're proud to announce that every single county, all 87 counties and over 140 cities uh, joined the settlements and signed on to our state local agreement, which is a really a key part of maximizing the amount of funds that we're going to get uh, from, from the from settlements. Next slide. So the other, the, the final key part, as Attorney General mentioned, is this bill that's in front of you, this legislative change that's required under our agreement. Um, with that, I'm going to pass it to Eric, who's going to get into some more of the details of the legislation uh, that's required under, under this agreement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Romanoff. Uh, Mr. Maloney, uh, welcome to the committee, and you may introduce yourself and start your presentation, please. Thank you, uh, Chair Fish, and, and good morning, members. I'm Eric Maloney, Assistant AG with the uh, Minnesota AG's office. And I'll, I'll walk you through the uh, back half of this uh, presentation, which is focused on um, kind of moving from this agreement and settlements and, you know, why we're, you know, pushing this, this 
legislation to be passed to, to implement these, these settlements. So as it says here, the linchpin of this agreement is that the AG's office and governments um, kind of work together to uh, pass a bill to make sure that the settlement funds can flow directly to local governments. It's the legislative well, legislative modification is the is the term of art used in the agreement. Um, and I'll go into some more detail later about kind of how that interacts with the HF 400 framework. Um, but it's it's basically kind of changing it to make sure that the settlement funds aren't flowing through you know the kind of state funds and that they are going right to local governments. That was a direct ask by them. Important point to make is that if if legislation is not passed this session, uh, you know we've we've talked about the seventy five twenty five split. Um, without a bill this session, uh, the seventy five twenty five split can happen. Instead, it is a is a sixty forty split, uh, sixty percent local, forty percent state. But based on how current law works, that actually becomes more of an eighty twenty split. Um, so you know that's that's the kind of downside of you know if this legislation can't get done. Um, you know, there's, there's a, a kind of lower share for state government uh, without this law being in place. So we have, I think at least two or not more, if, if not more of the authors of HF 400 here. So I don't think I need to go into too much detail on it, but it is kind of the bedrock of, uh, you know, what we're trying to do now uh, uh, a few years later. So at, as we all know, you know, back in 2019, HF 400 was passed. It kind of did it, three key things. Um, it required opioid makers and just and uh, wholesalers to uh, pay increased fees if they were uh, dealing in opioids. It created a, a special opioid fund for both state litigation recoveries and for those fees, kind of separate from the state general fund. And it set up the opioid advisory council uh, to make grant recommendations of spending from that from that fund. So why are we here today? Basically, this is this is an update, kind of a refresh of HF 400 to kind of, to you know basically stand up with these new settlements that have come since this bill was passed, with this new agreement that's come since this this bill was passed. And there's three main items that are in the bill uh, that we're we're kind of looking at to make sure that everything syncs up, work together, and so we can unlock you know maximum settlement funds for the state of Minnesota. Uh, so first item is that. Uh, is to release or unlock the settlement funds, and I'll talk some more in, in the next slide about what that means. Uh, second is to amend the, the statute to implement the 75-25 local state split. And the third is to put in place a claim bar, uh, ensure that, that Minnesota has the maximum payments coming in uh, with no risk of reduction or delay in the future. So the first item is unlocking the opioid settlement funds. So Current law provides that any settlements that um, that come from the AG's office, you know, that we that we enter into, uh, are deposited into a separate account in the state treasury. So this is what our office has has called a, a lockbox. But basically, those monies aren't going into the opioid fund itself. They're going to a separate account, and they are staying there until the. Uh, Board of Pharmacy fees, those those registration fees and uh, licensure fees um, are are sunset, and that was a part of HF 400 where, you know, once we a at 2024 and B have received 250 million dollars from settlements and fees, then those licensure and, and registration fees would 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 sunset, and then at at that point and only at that point. Uh, would the AG settlement funds be transferred out of this account into the fund to be used? Um, so our goal here, this is what HF uh, 4265 does, is to change current law to say, no, those those settlement funds shouldn't be kept in this lockbox, you know, kind of locked away. We want those funds to be put to use right away. So we'll have those transferred right into the opioid fund as soon as we get them, rather than kind of waiting on the sunset. Uh, piece two, implementing the 75-25 allocation. Um, and how this is being done is setting up two accounts within the opioid fund, one for fees, one for settlement money. And this was you know, a big ask of cities and counties in the, in the negotiations that um, you know, they want to receive their settlement funds directly. 
Um, so under current law, um, how HF 400 kind of set this system up, money is received by the state, both from fees and from settlements. 50% uh, of those of those monies are being distributed to county and tribal social service agencies for child protection services. So basically, like, there's, there's kind of already a 50-50 split in, in state law. Uh, so, but it, it's all the money is kind of flowing through the state. It's it's going out through through DHS uh, and going to counties that way. Um, and a key this this key negotiation point was for the for let's let's keep that in place for the the uh, you know the board of pharmacy fees, but let's change that for the settlement so that you know counties can get their funds directly. Um, so that's what HF two six five does. It says we have a new settlement account. Uh, there's no more county share that, that comes from that. Instead, counties are getting their share directly from the, the settlement folks. It's not coming through the state, not coming through DHS. Um, and this, this, this does keep in place. It's, it's, it's good to note that uh, this, this uh, tribal share is still in place um, with the new open settlement account. This just removes the 50% county share and now receive it uh, directly. And this also ensures that you know with with the state share of the settlement funds that the the, the vast majority of those will go right to ORAC and not be subject to kind of a further bifurcation. Last item here is the claims bar. So as I won't uh, go go too much into this, but the the structure of the settlements requires what the what the companies call global peace, which is basically you know we resolve ongoing lawsuits and prevent future lawsuits. And that is, you know, what H four two six five does is it has a claim bar, um, which you know it complements the broad sign on that the AGO has already gotten, right? So it's not like you know there's you know X number of of, of lawsuits uh, in, in in the state that the AGO is you know barring in the first instance with this law. This is we already have sign on from all eighty seven counties and one hundred and forty cities, and putting this in place ensures that Minnesota receives maximum payments. And it eliminates the risk of a future lawsuit, which could reduce payments, it could delay payments. Um, and you know, that would be you know, problematic as you know, we're, we're trying to have both the, the, the state apparatus and these and counties you know, have, a, have a dedicated funding stream to count on for all this. Uh, and one final point to make on this is that this claims bar does have a very narrow scope. It's not any opioid lawsuit, it's not against a company, it's just for, these four companies and these two settlements, that's only claims tied to opioids. So a very narrow claims bar that kind of lets Minnesota get the maximum benefit from the settlement. Uh, so uh, last slide here is just a few points about, you know, what happens if this does not pass. Um, just to kind of tick, tick through these, you know, as we kind of started this whole thing out with, um, you know, this carefully crafted agreement can't be implemented without this law, it's kind of a, the final step of it. Um, we would have delayed payments. Um, once the law is passed, we could have our payments come as, as soon as, as April, as soon as in a, in a few days here. Um, without this law being passed, we'd have to wait until August at the, at the very earliest. Um, this would keep settlement funds in what we call the, the lockbox until 2024. So those funds would be, you know, have to sit there and not be usable until then. Uh, Minnesota makes out on millions of dollars in, in some funds without the claims bar being in place. Uh, there would be decreased funding for ORAC for the state share uh, based on, with, without this law, there's no 525 split, right? It's the 80-20 split. So that's less funding for ORAC at work. Uh, counties will lose the benefit of direct payments, and that's, that was a big, big ask by them. Uh, cities also suffer because under current law, you know, there's the 50-50 share which, which goes to counties, uh, cities don't get a piece to that. So if there's no law, you know, cities will still have a share, but it's it's disproportionate decrease uh, versus what would be in place if the law were passed. Uh, so with that, it's the whole presentation. So we have some of our contact information here, uh, both our website, this is the kind of national website. Uh, and I think with that, we will stand for questions. Thank you, Chair. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Maloney. At this point in time, I will open it up for uh, any questions that people might have. Uh, Representative Frankie, go ahead, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to thank um, 
attorney Allison and his team for the great work. Um, this money is very needed. We need to get it out. We need to get this bill passed. So good job. Thank you for sticking up for Minnesota. Thank you, Representative Frankie. Uh, not seeing any other questions, I also want to thank uh, Attorney General uh, uh, Ellison and his team for being here today, providing us this information. It's very helpful. And uh, I want to say that it's been very informative. Uh, there is one question that I had. Uh, this goes back to um, the slides under item two, the implementation, where it says, uh, where it was saying that uh, the settlement, you know, it's saying how the settlement payments would work and it, ensuring that the vast majority of the state settlement funds go directly to ORAC. Uh, it says the vast majority of the funds go to ORAC. Where do those remaining state funds end up going to? And I don't know oh, who's best to answer that. Uh, Mr. Maloney, go ahead, sir. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. So uh, I believe how HF4265 sets this up is that there is a kind of hierarchy of appropriations from the sub funds. And first are, uh, there are already like appropriations set up in HF400 that come from the kind of current version of the opioid fund. And it, it's kind of meant to, meant to backfill those first if the licensure fees don't already cover those. I think in most cases, the, the, the licensing will cover those first, but that's the kind of first priority. Um, second appropriation from those funds is the tribal social service agent, agency share. Uh, so that's just kind of, corresponding to current law. Um, so that's that that's a pretty small share that would come from those those funds. And then uh, the the re remaining monies would then go to to OREC for the for their work. Okay, thank you. That's uh, that's what I was kind of wondering. So thank you for that. That helps give me a better idea where where they're going, make sure no one was missed out of the process. Representative Baker. Go ahead, uh, sir. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, I just wanted to make a, a kind of a, a comment here. Um, uh, the AG's office has done a great job along this way to, to kind of present the facts. This was a challenging agreement to work through when you really consider um, statewide, all the people we had to work with uh, from counties, larger cities, it was a very complex web. And, and the work that ORAC has done that I've been a part of since the beginning of this uh, is where the real action takes place in Minnesota that We've been very supportive of, of helping counties and other uh, nonprofits and, and for profits and other cities to get um, you know, programs up and running and continuing them. You, you know, we might have heard of some echo programs that are teaching doctors how to prescribe better. We are dealing with a fentanyl crisis right now. We, our council has very big authority. You know, I know that in the AG's pre presentation, it said we recommend the, the grants. No, we actually do the granting itself. It doesn't go back to the commissioner VHS to for final review. We do that because we follow the DHS granting uh, process very carefully, uh, and it's a scoring system. And yet, our 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 council has that kind of authority. So we are very involved in uh, federal uh, grants and support in our state licensing fees that were increased uh, with our House File 400 bill. So I'm I'm really proud of the work that we're working on and still doing, and we're still learning and growing. We're still a relatively young council, but uh, uh, I think the legislators that would have seen us and watched us in a corner would be really proud of how we've really taken a, a clean slate. There wasn't a model to work with when, when Representative Olson and I were working on this bill. There wasn't anything to start this from. And this is a, a piece of legislation that started this, this getting better now with more dollars coming to Minnesota will do a lot of good things. So um, I just, uh, again, I can't thank Representative Olson enough. I can't thank the Attorney General's office enough for all the work that we've done together. Um, and uh, this is the kind of stuff that makes me feel really good about doing this job. Uh, we don't see this uh, enough, you know, at least it's in the, you know, that's in the headlines. So, uh, and I'm glad I came back here, Mr. Fisher, Chair Fisher. I, I think, again, you've ran a really good committee that wants to understand these issues. And I'm glad uh, it's well on its way. It's been through other committees already in the House. 
Uh, we've had a couple bumps and hiccups along the way, but we're able to get together and work on these things. And, and that's a, a testimony to also uh, the, the chief author on this, Rep Olson. So I just wanna say thanks everybody for a great job. And I hope legislators, when it gets to the house floor, that we all get behind this bill, it's supported. It. It's, it's not perfect, but it's as perfect as we can get it with as many moving parts as there is. So uh, thanks again, Mr. Chair. And again, thanks to my good friend, Liz Olson for this, thank you. Thank you, Representative Baker, and thank you for the work and your passion in this area. It's, it's, it's incredible the way that uh, everybody has come together to address this across the entire state here to help address a serious problem that's out there. And, and I think this is a good segue now is, as we're talking about this, as we start moving from the Attorney General's presentation, moving on into our informational hearings. And the first thing that we're going to be looking at is going to be hearing about House File 4260 which Representative Baker and Representative Olson have been working very strongly on. Uh, they've been working closely on this over the years on the opioid legislation, and so they'll be presenting this bill together. So I'd like to move on to this next phase. So good morning. I'd like to say good morning and welcome to the committee, Representative Olson. I'll have you start off, and then we'll rotate, from my understand, between you and Representative Baker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Well, to be honest, I think the AG's office did such a phenomenal job. I wish they could present all of my bills for me. Um, there isn't much left to say, to be honest. They did such a fantastic job and such a thorough job walking through it and Representative Baker providing that context to why and the work that's gone into it. There, there isn't a lot, I don't need to really go through. I'm happy to answer questions, but they hit the three main points of the bill, which is implementing the 75-25 split they're releasing the claim or releasing the funds and the claims bar. Uh, and they really did a thorough job explaining why. I will say from perspective of, I see a number of folks here for probably other things regarding this committee too, but I uh, wanna say for the advocates that worked on House File 400, the most important thing that we did was we wanted money out to fight the opioid epidemic. That was our guiding principle is how quickly and thoughtfully we could get money out where it is needed. And House File 4265, again, very technical as described um, and an agreed upon settlement, uh, the, what, what the stakeholders have all agreed upon that we need to do. This is just another step in being able to get you know, over $300,000 out um, to the front lines to make sure that Representative Baker and the ORAC group um, to other places in our state, to our counties, um, that we're really making sure, and I know from your, your perspective, Chair Fisher and members, um, you work on this every day in this committee. And so this is just uh, another step and be able to have the resources needed to, uh, to really stem the tide on something that unfortunately has gotten worse for the last two years. Um, so that's really what this is. I won't go into much more. Uh, we've had stops in health and judiciary already and been able to vet the bill through that. I will also say to just thank you to the attorney general's office, to uh, the attorney general himself for, you know, fighting and making sure the terms of the settlement were good for Minnesota. In particular, I know that Representative Baker and I cared a lot about what was covered, but one piece that wasn't was also the disclosure of documents so that we could understand um, what had happened to, to create this crisis. And that's something that uh, I know attorney general Ellison really fought for. Um, and was very vocal about that and deserves a lot of uh, you know, accolades for making that happen. Um, and just thank his team, Eric and Evan and James Kennedy, who's not here, but who have been working on this and helped us craft the original House File 400 um, to best anticipate as we could what would be coming with the settlement. And now that we're actually here to make the changes we need to, to really capture those funds and get them out where they're needed. And of course, Representative Baker being there every step of the way doing this work from day one all the way through to hopefully he can move on to something else at some point. <laughs> but I know he does great work in other ways too. So, and with that, I think I will just, you know, happy to answer questions, uh, but I think we've had a very thorough and great presentation already. Thank you, Representative Olson. Representative Baker, would you like to have anything else that you would like to add at this point in time? You know, again, I think uh, Rep. Olson said it best. I think a lot of has been said. I think the one question that keeps coming up with a few folks is one of the changes is, is a, and again, holding true to our word of House File 400 was that uh, until the state received $250 million, which we had no idea back in 2019 when and where that was gonna come from, but it was a number we felt was important. Uh, now we know what this, this settlement looks like. 
we also know when it's going to come to the state of Minnesota. And it's not going to be immediately. It's going to be over a period of time. So we had to delay the sunset of our fees that we put in place for licensing. Uh, but I just want to make sure that it wasn't like we're just backing it up for no reason at all. It's when the money gets to Minnesota that reaches that $250 million. So uh, for, for members of there that see the, the language on there and when it comes down the road further on for voting, it's, it's we're holding true to the word of our bill. It's to make sure that we uh, do what we say we're going to do. It's getting the help out there. And um, um, there's no surprises to that. But again, um, no, I think uh, everybody has done a good job and we're, we're really open for questions. We want you to know that there's a lot of things moving in on the world of opioids and, and just addiction in general. And this committee is an important part of that. And as members know people in our own communities and our own districts, uh, there are advocates all over the place helping people every single day, people in recovery every single day that see what we're doing. And yet we have uh, so far to go to help uh, more things, but we're doing a lot of good stuff here. Uh, and this is uh, one of those areas. So nothing further for me, Mr. Chair, just uh, proud to be a part of it. Thank you, Representative Baker. And once again, thank you for all the work that you've done over the years on, on the opioid issue. Uh, at that, are there any other questions or comments that members have at this point in time? Uh, Representative Frankie, go ahead, sir. Thank you, Chair Fisher. Thank you, Representative Olson and Representative Baker. Um, Representative Baker, you mentioned there's been some hiccups along the way. Uh, Representative Olson, um, this is your bill. I was wondering, could you just give us maybe two pushbacks you're getting um, so that we know what to look for? What are the maybe two quick, I know we're kind of crunched for time here, things you're hearing or, or that members are, are acquiescing about or having issues with um, with the bill. Representative Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I don't think there really is, to be honest. It's gone through both of its committees with uh, you know unanimous support and there really hasn't been any pushback to this at all. I think it took so much work on the front end, perhaps that was what Representative Baker was, was talking about in order to get the agreed upon bill. But we have the original four bill authors that worked on four, House File 400, you know, carrying this legislation and working together as, uh, as a team. So I, I think we, I would actually say there hasn't been, uh, which is great. And just the testament to, again, how much work went in on the front end. Thank you, Representative Paulson. Uh, Representative Frankie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, that's great to hear. That was kind of what my thought process was. So I was just kind of hoping that because I know um, uh, starting way, you know, several years ago, Representative Baker's passion and, and then yours on this issue and to see how well everybody's worked together to, to get it to this point has, it just is amazing. Um, so thank you, Representative Olson. Thank you, Representative Baker for the great work on this and the continued passion and partnership um, to get this across the line. So thank you. Thank you, Representative Frankie. I am not seeing any other hands up there. So I'd like to say to Representative Olson and Representative Baker, thank you both for the work that you've been putting in on this issue over the years, the passion that goes into this, because this is, you show very clearly, this is not a partisan issue. This is an issue that affects all of Minnesota. And as a result, all of Minnesota comes together to address this in a very strong bipartisan way with the hard work being done. Uh, and I know at times it's not been easy. There's been pushback. There's been some very hard things that have had to be uh, ironed out in the process. And my hat's off to both of you uh, because that's what Minnesotans expect. They expect us to take a look at the serious issues out there, come together, have the the engaging discussions out there, figure out where the issues are, where the pitfalls are, work through those so that in the end, in the end, we have a bill that will better address the needs of Minnesotans out there in crisis, help those who have been dealing with the opioid crisis and put us in a much better uh, position going forward. So thank you both for what you've been doing on this. And what we're gonna do then is move next on to a presentation from the governor's office on the opioid fund provisions. And this will be a presentation by Ms. Grom from DHS. Ms. Grom, if you'd like to introduce yourself and start your part of the uh, presentation, please. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. For the record, my name is Christy Grom and I'm with the Department of Human Services. And I'm gonna go ahead and 
um, share my screen. One moment. All right. Um, so thank you so much for the opportunity um, to be with your be with you here today. Um, I'm also joined by my colleague Elise Bailey, who is our budget director at the Department of Human Services, and she's been really instrumental on um, our um, our opiate proposal as well as our work um, collaborating with the Attorney General's office on this topic. Um, so she'll be available to answer questions for us. Um, so I thought it'd be helpful just to share a bit of background. I know um, this might be a review for many folks, but hopefully a good refresher to just orient members to the origin of the issue and some of the current trends. So in the late 90s, pharmaceutical companies um, reassured the medical community that people wouldn't become addicted to opiate pain relievers, um, and they began to prescribe opiates at increasing rates. We now have some pretty significant evidence that shows that um, the crisis, the opiate crisis itself, was essentially created by these influential pharmaceutical companies whose corporate interests really went unchecked for a long period of time. We know a few companies in particular came up with um, a scheme that targeted healthcare workers, um, professional associations, policymakers, even um, entities that you would think of as, as being pretty neutral, so research institutions, advocacy groups. Um, in an effort to really expand the opiate market from people with cancer to larger groups of, of um, patients with chronic and acute pain. So we saw pharma using tactics um, to persuade um, physicians to increase doses, sort of downplay the, the risks of addiction, and essentially to gaslight physicians' concerns when they were raised. Um, so we saw increased prescribing as a result of those influences and tactics. Um, looking back, there was about um, three kind of distinct waves that we can see. So in the 90s, beginning um, in the 90s with overdose deaths, mostly being um, related to um, prescription opiates, so natural and semi-synthetic opioids, as well as methadone. And then in the 2000s, um, around 2010, we started to see really rapid increases in overdose deaths related to heroin. Um, and in 2013, um, we um, began to see sort of this next wave, which I think we're still really grappling with right now, um, overdose deaths related to synthetic opioids, so most notably substances like fentanyl. Um, around that time in 2014, we did um, begin to see a uh, wave of lawsuits um, related to, um, you know, pharmaceutical manufacturers and distributors and um, local governments and states wanting to seek justice for the harms done um, to communities across the nation. Not long thereafter, it became pretty apparent that we were in a state of crisis. So in 2017, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services um, declared the opiate crisis a public health emergency. Um, and I do want to mention, I think relevant to Minnesota, um, parallel to, to that occurring, DHS and the governor at that time advanced a pretty comprehensive set of substance use disorder um, reforms. Um, so we brought forward recommendations on direct access, which is a proposal um, to help facilitate more um, um, timely access to treatment services so people don't have to jump through hoops to get the, the health care that they need and the treatment that they need. Um, you might recall that that's actually a proposal in the governor's um, budget, the final phase of that proposal this year. Um, we brought forward new uh, medical assistance benefits. We brought forward treatment coordination, um, peer recovery support, and new withdrawal management MA benefit, um, as well as our 1115 substance use disorder demonstration, which we talked about a lot last session, but um, for as a reminder, that's a demonstration that requires evidence-based treatment services and better care coordination um, for people in treatment. So on this slide, you can see the increase in um, opioid deaths over the course of time. And I think um, our attorney general's office mentioned um, some of this data, but between 2000 and 2020, we've seen the annual deaths increase from 54 to 655 a year. Um, and you see a pretty dramatic escalation between 2019 and 2020. The, um, the slope of that, that line um, in there is, is pretty significant. So um, we're doing a lot of work, but systems change does take time. So we need to you know, really continue what we're doing, continue to invest and evaluate what's working um, and, and what's not and um, continue to um, intervene with strategies that um, can reduce these overdose deaths and, and um, address the crisis. Um, and you can see on this slide, the trend um, is most significantly increasing in American Indian and African American communities. So we've got 131 per 100,000 American Indians that are experiencing overdose deaths compared to 49 per 100,000 African American um, folks, and then 16 per 100,000 white folks experiencing overdose deaths. So um, pretty significant disparities. 
And um, here are just a visual of those disparities. I think it's helpful to really see how, how pronounced they are on this bar chart um, in front of you. Um, they're um, pretty acute. So um, moving to sort of the meat of what we wanna talk about today, um, the governor's proposal on um, the addressing the opiate epidemic. So um, this is House File 4576 and House File 4307. Um, this is an investment of about 2.6 million in uh, fiscal year 23 and 5.3 or so in 24-25. Um, so we've heard, just heard a lot about the, the recent opiate settlement, thanks to our wonderful attorney general and the staff attorneys there who've really worked tirelessly on the settlement. Um, you know, we're expected to see a really significant um, share of funding in Minnesota um, at the local level as well as at the state level. And as Mr. Maloney mentioned, um, conversations about the settlement started back in late summer, early fall. Um, DHS uh, participated in those conversations and spent a lot of time really listening to the community. So we heard from public health experts, local governments, state agencies, um, the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council, and people who were directly impacted by the opiate crisis. So the governor's proposal on this topic was really born in large part out of those stakeholder discussions um, with the primary focus of our proposal. Um, hopefully it's complementary to the attorney general's proposal um, and representative Olson's bill um, really being to address the disparities that exist and to lift up the voices and the experiences of black indigenous and communities of color who are impacted. Um, so the governor and lieutenant governor's initial budget recommendations are um, notated on this slide here. And you can see in bold the revised uh, budget recommendations that came out following the February forecast. Um, but just for a brief overview here. So the initial budget recommendations included expanded membership on the Opiate Epidemic Response Advisory Council, um, often called ORAC. So um, we also added um, um, that part of that increased uh, membership was adding a member from each tribal nation to, to represent um, those governments on the council. Um, we've also added a threshold for the ratio of ORAC grant recommendations for programs that are culturally specific or culturally responsive. So requiring the commissioner to make sure that 40% of those, at least 40% of those grant recommendations are for culturally responsive or specific programs. Um, and right now the ORAC is doing a great job in actually um, over 40% of their um, of their grant recommendations are going to those those programs. So we want to make sure to maintain that. Um, we've added ongoing funding for traditional healing grants, um, as well as some reporting requirements for municipalities um, who are set to receive that direct funding. So in other words, that funding that's outside of the state special revenue opiate fund from the settlements. Um, and then just moving to um, the revised budget recommendations on this topic, um, you can see those in bold. Um, so um, we've added additional membership updates. So we're adding two members to the ORAC from our urban American Indian populations to make sure that those populations are well represented on the council. And then also requiring that at least 50% of the council as we start to add new members um, are representative of, of people who are actually impacted by the opiate crisis, either themselves or maybe a close loved one who's been impacted. Um, the revised recommendations also include base funding for overdose prevention grants. Um, these are grants that are set to expire in 2025. Um, and they increase access to naloxone. So um, really key intervention in preventing overdose deaths and saving lives. Um, and in addition, we're recommending a new grant um, that supports communities that have been disproportionately impacted by opiate use disorders. Um, these are grants that can be used for culturally specific practices as well as um, to address social determinants of health. So things like housing, healthcare, and education um, to help prevent opiate use disorders and then really address the impact of the crisis. Those grants, um, we're thinking of those as, as grants for smaller organizations that have boards that represent communities that are disproportionately affected by the crisis. And then lastly, I wanted to mention the updated language as it relates to outcome reporting for municipal governments um, on their direct share of settlement funds. So we have worked um, pretty diligently with, with counties and the attorney general's office, our, um, our experts at MNB's Results First program um, to better define the reporting requirements in law and really align those with the memorandum of agreement related to the settlement. So we're hopeful that the updated language um, really strikes the right balance of achieving accountability, um, but also administrative ease for local governments who are really trying to, to do their best to manage the crisis at the local level. Um, and most importantly, um, allowing us to get an ability and, and the ORAC to be able to see um, kind of what's happening at the local level. What are those promising practices that we want to maybe research more, um, evaluate and maybe replicate so that Minnesotans across the state can, 
um, benefit from those, those strategies. Um, and so that's all I have, uh, Mr. Chair members. Thank you again for the opportunity. I will turn it back to you at this point and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Graham, for the presentation. At this point, are there any questions or issues uh, that people have? Representative Frankie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just have a quick question and I don't know if Ms. Graham or Rep. Olson or Baker, whoever is still on, I know Rep. Baker still is, um, about the granting process, Representative Baker had mentioned in his um, representation about the power of the ORAC Commission to that they have granting power. Um, who is going to be, um, I guess, you know, dedicating where these grants go to and how they are used? Is this money going to be um, handled and and put out by ORAC and, and or DHS or is it a partnership? Um, how is that going to work? Thank you, Representative Frankie. I see uh, Representative Baker has popped. I see Ms. Grom is here. Um, I, I, I'll go to Representative Baker first. It seems like he's uh, ready and then we can go to Ms. Grom for anything that she would like to add. Yeah, and, Baker. And that, thanks, Mr. Chair. And I think that's a really good question for the for the committee to know. And again, if I get something wrong, I know Christy will help me clarify something I might have said wrong. But um, so again, um, we've been collecting licensing fees that we increased to pharmaceutical companies, and it's been roughly about 14 million a year. About half of that right away goes to the counties for child protection. Uh, there's also about a 3 million or so that goes to the tribes right away too. So what's left over sort of is what ORAC can use for this granting. So we do these RFPs once or twice a year. So we put out these re re requests for proposals and we shout it out to the world. We work with the uh, Minnesota Department of Health and, and their grant managers. We work with DHS and their grant managers. Uh, we've got the Department of Corrections on our group. So these go out publicly. We do the scoring system that DHS has in place to make sure we, we vet the right groups so that we're not giving uh, grants to people that don't uh, aren't aren't set up right. They're not their purpose isn't what it is. So we've got very specific buckets, and then we after the scoring process of of making sure that people that are on the scoring committee aren't uh, uh, showing a conflict of interest. And we've got again people uh, lawyers. Uh, we've got folks that are on ORAC that can be on ORAC on this committee. So that again I, I mentioned that the conflict of interest is really a big deal. Um, so uh, it's then we decide we've got, let's say $4 million to grant out in this round. We've got these selected buckets we wanna focus on, whether it's prevention or education, maybe it's naloxone, maybe it's um, workforce issues that we can do things with to get more drug counselors out there. So, it, it, and then again, we basically then through the scoring process, we make our final determinations and we say, here's where the money's gonna go. And, and again, the commissioner will put their stamp on it, uh, but that's, that's how it doesn't, it doesn't get changed after that. So it's quite a process to do that. Thank you, Representative Baker. Ms. Graham, is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members, no, I think um, I think Representative Baker covered it well. It's, it's definitely a collaborative process. Ultimately, the money is appropriated to the, the commissioner, but we, um, you know, take our guidance from the ORAC and the wisdom that that they have and all of their recommendations that they make to us. Thank you. And a good Ross. point there too, and Mr. Chair. What I forgot to mention too is when we make our decision to Rep. Frankie. It goes back to DHS and then they execute the contracts with clarity. They have the expectations there. So they kind of have the final steps of deploying the funds, but then those uh, uh, grantees uh, know exactly the, the terms and all those kind of things. So they really make sure the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. So uh, that's a good part that I kind of missed on that. Thanks for the question. Thank you, Representative Baker. Representative Frankie, anything else that you'd like to ask at this point? No, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank You're you. welcome. Thank you, Representative Frankie. Thank you, Ms. Graham, for being here and, and the presentation. Uh, with that, members, we are going to move on to the next part of our, our committee hearing here. And what we're going to be doing is there's a couple of information bills that we have. We have one that's going to be from Representative uh, Stevenson. We've got one that uh, I'll be putting out there. And what this is, is we're starting to move into the next part of we've heard many, many uh, issues over the last couple of years in the behavioral health system. We all know that the behavioral health system was never built out the way it was needed to be to address the issues that our state has. We've also been challenged with the fact that we've got huge stigmas that are 
throughout the society. In some years, it makes it much more difficult for people to receive services versus others. And it's also complicated. And what I mean by that, it's not just in one area or uh, one agency's uh, responsibility. Uh, to me, it's very complicated. It's it's very complicated and overreaching, as we would see in the water. In the state of Minnesota, our water is divided up responsibility between a number of different agencies, and sometimes the flow of that does not always work well. As people get confused, which agency they should be working with, who has jurisdiction, and you get fights that sometimes break out. And sometimes I and sometimes they get too siloed. Uh, in behavioral health, I can see the same thing as so often people say, well, this is a Department of Human Services thing. But as we've heard in our committee over the last year, it's not just the Department of Human Services. We've seen bills come through going to the health committee. We've seen education. We've seen things in higher education. We've seen the impact in corrections. We've seen the impact in public safety, judiciary, uh, housing, you know, even how it plays out in housing. And so one of the things that as we're talking about envisioning here is how do we build this better system? And at the same time, how do we do this in such ways that we're making sure that we're coordinating between all the different agencies as it's not just one agency. And so what, I, what we have is a couple of bills here. Uh, what, uh, one is, and I will say that uh, uh, having talked to Representative Stevenson and I also know with my own bill, our bills are a starting point for these discussions. There needs to be work done on them. Uh, based on input that we've had over the last few weeks and also going forward. Some of these things we may figure out this session yet. Some of these things I also think are longer visionary things that we're going to want to keep in mind going forward is how can we pull this together so that uh, from the administration side, they've got uh, the clear focus and understanding of how to help uh, better pull things together and coordinate. And from our side, what do we need to be doing better in terms of policy coordination, Start in terms of setting policy, even funding as we go in the future. And so these are some of the larger visionary things that I think we need to be keeping in mind as we're talking about these bills here. And these bills are not meant as a criticism of the administration or any department, but they are as they're laying the groundwork of how do we have this uh, bigger discussion of, of reimagining how do we deal with the behavioral issue, health issues in our state, not only between divisions, but also tackling the stigmas that continue to remain out there. And so at this point in time, what I'd like to do is seeing we're on an information business, we're gonna to move to House File 3086, which is represent, Representative Stevenson's bill. Um, and I'm gonna move this along because I'm not too sure how much time that uh, our committee would like to engage. So we do have some testifiers too. So I'm gonna have Representative Stevenson uh, you know, talk about his bill to us. Uh, then we'll have some testifiers. And then after the testifiers, we'll do some questions. We also have the Commissioner Harpstad here who will talk about where the agency is right now, where Department of Human Services, some things that they're dealing with, and then we'll get to my bill. And so in some ways, I think we may be pressed on time before we get to the end, because uh, I'd like to reserve a few minutes at the end to thank the staff and acknowledge that we're starting to wrap up our work for this session. So at that, uh, Representative Stevenson, uh, welcome to the committee and go ahead and, and, and present your bill to us and, and, and educate us about your bill what you're trying to do, what's happening, et cetera. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee uh, for having me uh, today and giving me the opportunity to discuss uh, this bill that's very, very important. You know, I don't often venture into the DHS uh, uh, space, but I think that this is a, just a, one of the most critical issues we're facing as a state is the crisis that we're experiencing in behavioral health. And I really appreciate the work that this committee is doing has done today uh, discussing the opioid aspect of, of the behavioral health crisis that we're experiencing. It's been very informative and helpful uh, for me uh, hearing that and tracks very closely with my experiences both here at the legislature and in my day job as a prosecutor uh, to see uh, the impact of that crisis. But the, the behavioral health crisis extends, of course, beyond just opioids and extends to other areas, uh, in particular uh, uh, mental health. And, um, you know, the, the framework that I would want uh, members to know what, that I think about, the things that I think about when I think about this issue is that we are at a point where over 20% of Minnesotan, uh, Minnesota adults report having a mental illness. Uh, think about that, one in five report it. And of course we know with all the stigma uh, that we experience around mental illness, uh, the true number of people who have mental illness is much higher. And I'm sure many members on this committee have had the experience of talking to a parent 
with a child who's suffering from extreme uh, mental illness, a parent who hasn't been able to get uh, their child the treatment that they need. Maybe there isn't a bed uh, available in a treatment facility or the type of treatment isn't there. And that's because as I've heard said many times, including by the, the chair uh, just a moment ago, the problem with our mental health system isn't that it's broken, it's that it was never built in the first place. Uh, so we have a, just a crisis in behavioral health in, in Minnesota, uh, and we don't really have the infrastructure for it. And that's perhaps evidence, one piece of evidence of that is that we don't have a department of behavioral health. We have a division within uh, DHS. And all this bill does is it, it seeks to take that division and elevate the good work that the people in that division are doing and make it a standalone cabinet agency. Why? The nature of this crisis is so severe. We need someone with true statutory authority, with true accountability and a direct line to the governor uh, to deal with this problem on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, the people at DHS, they're working really hard. They're doing good work. This is not meant to be a criticism or attack on them. This is about saying that we need to do even more and elevate this even more. Uh, you know, the di division of behavioral health uh, right now constitutes about 2%, just 2% of DHS's budget. And I think when you hear the, the, the testimony that we've heard today about the opioid epidemic, when you think about those parents who are struggling to take care of their kids with mental illness, or the, you know, thousands of Minnesotans who are experiencing mental illness in, in, the, in the shadows, they deserve a commissioner who's 100% focused on this. And that's not meant to be a criticism at all of Commissioner Harpstead, who's doing great work. Uh, but she's got a lot of other issues on her plate too. And so this proposal just creates a new, uh, new department uh, to focus on this particular crisis. The, the thing that I will leave you with before we turn over the testimony is just this, you know, over the last year through my work on the Commerce Committee, I've had occasion to visit uh, with all 11 of the uh, tribes in Minnesota and I've physically visited eight of them. And I was up, I've been up to Red Lake twice uh, in Northwestern Minnesota. And uh, it's, it's a, quite an experience to have the opportunity to visit Red Lake Nation and uh, it's a unique place. It's the only closed reservation in, in Minnesota. I encourage members to go and visit. But I was talking to a, 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 a enrolled member there who noted to me, this was in November, that they had had almost 200 uh, op <coughs> op uh, opioid overdose deaths uh, in that community uh, that, uh, by that point in the year. You know, Red Lake is uh, uh, the, the population that reservation is around 5,000 people. Can you imagine living in a community of 5,000 people where 200 were taken away in a year by opioid overdoses? Most of all of us represent about 40,000 people. So do the math. Can you imagine if 1,600 people in your district died in a year from opioids? It's just an unbelievable crisis. And we need uh, to take dramatic action to address it. And that's what this bill is trying to do, overhaul the systems. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I know there are testifiers who wish to speak to the bill. Thank you, Representative Stevenson. Uh, first uh, testifier that I have is Mr. Randy Anderson. If you'd like to introduce yourself, uh, who you're with and start your testimony. And uh, I do want to keep it, uh, try to keep within two to three minutes so that we can hear from the other testifiers and be able to uh, uh, hear from the department and also be able to have time for members to have a, a good discussion. Uh, Mr. Anderson, if you'd like to go ahead, please. Good morning, and thank you, Chair Fisher and committee, committee members. My name is Randy Anderson. I'm the founder and principal with Bold North Recovery. And I just really want to thank you for the opportunity to provide my thoughts with all of you today. And I just have to thank you, Representative Stevenson, for bringing this forward. I've, in the last 18 months, I've lost my sister, my birth mom, and my stepdad to substance use disorder. And so, uh, yeah, so this is a very important issue to me. So I'm a I'm a person living in long-term recovery from substance use. And what that means to me is I have not had any alcohol, drugs, or mood altering substance since January 9, 2005. And because of my recovery, I'm, I'm able to have healthy relationships, own a home, run a successful small business, vote, and even pay taxes. I'm also a Minnesota state licensed alcohol and drug counselor, a peer recovery specialist, and a formerly incarcerated person who was sentenced to 87 months in prison as a first time nonviolent drug user with little to no criminal history. I started my small business, Bold North Recovery in 2019, primarily to work outside the huge bureaucracies that exist. I consider myself to be very lucky 
and privileged to do the work I'm able to do today, especially when it comes to advocacy and finding help in the community for people struggling with substance related issues. The second part hasn't always been so easy for me. Navigating our current system can be one of the most difficult tasks for anyone trying to find help for themselves, a friend or a loved one. I've worked in the substance use disorder field since 2015. And one of the most frustrating things for me is not knowing who has authority over what. I work with small providers daily that tell me they feel like no one is listening. Just last week, I spoke with a very good friend of mine who runs a small licensed program in the metro area. And she told me she had asked some questions of DHS back in October and no one has ever gotten back to her. I would like to tell you that last week's conversation was unusual and only happens once in a while. However, it is not, and it happens often in my world. When talking to my network of small and large providers in the SUD field, there's one common theme. DHS is too big, and they wish there was an agency or a department where they felt heard, more included, better communicated with. I do support House File 3086, which would create a department that has substance use and mental health services as their only duties and priorities. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Anderson, for your testimony. Next, I have uh, Ms. Jody Freyholtz. If you'd like to introduce yourself, uh, who you're with, and start your testimony, please. Absolutely. Thank you, and good morning, Representative Fisher, committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, and a huge thank you to Representative Stevenson for bringing this bill forward. I'm Jody Freyholtz, London. I live in Todd County, Minnesota. I am the founder and executive director of Wellness in the Woods. We have 42 staff members, all of whom are in recovery, and our certified peer specialists or certified recovery coaches providing non-billable um, inclusive support to individuals across the state of Minnesota. I've worked with the mental health field for about 35 years, and some of the things that Randy just mentioned, um, I can absolutely echo. It is difficult for those of us who are receiving services and are advocating for better services in our state to actually make progress through the huge um, difficulties that we face every day working with a giant a group of people who don't always know who to go to or who is in charge of what pieces, and we certainly have contracts with the state of Minnesota. We provide an overnight warm line from five at night until nine in the morning, all staffed by individuals who may have had barriers to employment and are now being paid and working. During the day, we provide a virtual peer support network, but the difficult piece in making these things happen is certainly not through a billable process because we've determined as an organization over the last nine years, that there are many people who need these services and these support services that we feel is best provided by people who've had a lived experience. By bringing forward an actual commissioner at the table and a department of behavioral health, we feel that we will get the recognition that we absolutely and positively need, that this will streamline any of the work that needs to be done. Um, I found it really interesting yesterday no, last week when I was part of the, um, a Senate committee hearing talking about if there was an, a group of people who really needed funding to keep doing their work, what would be the timeline for them to get that money that they needed right now? Six months, six months minimum that it would take to go through the process. So we are certainly supporting, Wellness in the Woods is supporting the development of this process of a commissioner who will be sitting at the governor's table You've heard the data that's been shared by a number of people already. How many of us are impacted? The number of people impacted during COVID has certainly increased. We saw our warm line numbers and people just calling for support increase from about 1,200 a month to almost 2,000 people a month calling and needing that support. Um, the, time is, the time is now to make this happen and to streamline ways that we can continue to help people without waiting six months or more for those things to happen. So thank you for allowing me to present this morning and a huge thank you to Representative Stevenson for bringing this bill forward. 
You're welcome, Ms. Freyholz. Thank you for being here this morning. And our next te uh, testifier is Mr. Magnuson. If you'd like to go ahead and introduce yourself and who you're with and start your testimony, please. Thank you, Chairman Fisher and Representative Stevenson and members of the committee. My name is John Magnuson, and I'm the Executive Director of March, the Minnesota Association of Resources for Recovery and Chemical Health. We're the statewide association of providers and professionals who treat substance use disorders and the many co-occurring mental health issues, issues that affect every family in Minnesota. In fact, untreated addiction and the ongoing stigma is America's number one health issue. Time that we elevate the issue where it belongs and build the mental health structure that needs to be below it to help address the co-occurring conditions. Addiction goes beyond just opioids too. I wanna to remind everyone that alcohol is still the number one substance that we treat people for and meth right now is spiking in our state. So March supports the spirit and intent of this legislation to lift up and address the growing crisis of the disease of addiction in Minnesota through the development and implementation of an inclusive and comprehensive response. As you know, our state continues to be significantly impacted by untreated addiction and the state's current fractured approach in responding is not working. As providers, we see firsthand the devastating consequences this lack of focus brings to patients and their families. We hear the names, Jake, Simon, Lucas, Mikey, Susie, Sam. Those are just the names that I've come in contact with since we've started testimony on this. We struggle to have legislative changes implemented, funding prioritized, and the silos between agencies create bureaucratic roadblocks that prevent the government from being as effective as it could be in serving our patients and our local communities. In addition to the financial consequences of this inefficiency, the results for people are devastating. Drug overdose deaths are at record numbers, deadly fentanyl is saturating our communities, and Minnesotans continue to struggle with pandemic-related mental health challenges. We therefore support reforms that ensure Minnesota has a singular, elevated, and coordinated approach across the substance use continuum of care to better serve the people in our state. This approach needs to include education, prevention, treatment, supportive services, and recovery. It's beyond time that Minnesota has a plan that utilizes the full continuum of care that can be managed and implemented. Other states, the federal government, have been working toward this and the people of Minnesota deserve no less. Chair Fisher and committee in conclusion, this is a personal issue for me as well. I'm a person, in 23 years long-term recovery. And sometimes the only thing that I can offer to families is a shoulder to cry on and say, but there, but for the grace of God go I. So this is an issue that um, we look forward to working with you and the many federal, state and local authorities who will be needed to build a recovery oriented system of care that understands and treats addiction. Again, this is America's number one health issue. And thank you for the time today. Uh, thank you, Mr. Magnuson, for your testimony. And thank you to all three testifiers for sharing your stories with us and uh, for the difficulties that you folks have uh, experienced. Uh, next, I'd like to go to uh, uh, Commissioner Harpstad. I know that she has come into the department and has done a lot of work on doing changes and uh, process improvements. And I know that she has a uh, uh, some slides she'd like to share in her presentation. So, Commissioner Harpstad, welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself and uh, go ahead and start your presentation, please. Thank you, Chair Fisher, members of the committee. I'm Jody Harpstead, the Commissioner of the Department of Human Services. I want to thank you so much for focusing your time and energy and attention this morning on this enormous issue. Uh, we know that the behavioral health issues in the state and the substance use disorder issues in the state uh, have been with us for many years and have gotten worse. And coming out of COVID, they've been particularly elevated as people have been isolated over the last couple of years. And there's a lot of work to do and a need to turn our attention to new potential solutions. So thank you so much. I'm grateful that there is a committee that focuses on behavioral health in the house. And thank you for your good work. I've testified already some uh, during this session, and I'll just summarize some of the challenges we see with a separate agency on behavioral health. 
Uh, first, we would very much like to finish the work of hardwiring our process improvement work in the behavioral health division. We're well along the way and we can see the end from here, uh, but we still need to finish that work and make sure that everything is buttoned up in a way that we don't have the overpayment problems we had several years ago. Uh, the state of the art is integrating care across behavioral health and physical health, not separating it. And so there's an interest in keeping it together with our healthcare administration. Uh, the behavioral health division as a separate agency would be a tiny agency and would have to add finance, legal compliance, HR, tribal and county relations, et cetera, an expensive move. Uh, this would be the most complex potential split of DHS. There have been other uh, suggestions, as you know, uh, for splitting DHS in one way or another. This would be one of the most complex. With the federal requirement that we have a single Medicaid agency, which is DHS, and then um, after that, would this agent, small agency would handle less than 20% of all behavioral health funding anyway, as most of it does flow through our healthcare administration. In terms of focus, this would be the governor's 27th commissioner. It's only DHS's fourth administration's uh, assistant commissioner. And so uh, there are arguments that, that we can focus even better on behavioral health inside DHS than outside. I appreciate the conversation. I'm open to it, open to anything we can do to get a better handle on uh, behavioral health issues in Minnesota. Uh, but I wanted to share with you from my perspective, the challenges of separating the agency. Next slide, please. Also wanted to share what we are doing lately as we come out of COVID and face into these issues. Um, been talking to community leaders and advocates about how we should organize the DHS Behavioral Health Division. We are currently looking for a replacement for the Behavioral Health Division Director and what talent we should recruit. So we have an opportunity to put new leadership into this area. Um, and we're asking, people are suggesting things like we should have a leader focused in the Department on Children's Mental Health. Should we have a leader focused on addiction and recovery? Should we have a leader in recovery themselves? And we're open to those conversations and looking for the very best organization and the very best talent. We're working with March and others on a statewide summit for this summer as we come out of COVID to say, what's the state of the art in this space? Uh, we know that we've lost provider capacity and we know that the problem has gotten worse during COVID. Let's take a look at the medical data and level set with the Mayo Clinic and Hazelton and others and find out where we're at today on these issues and then draw a roadmap going forward as we did for our Children's Mental Health Summit in January, which has been uh, widely, widely regarded. I'm presenting to a judicial mental health summit tomorrow on the interactions between mental health services and the judicial system, including competency restoration, as we work to sort out the complex interactions between uh, the state of Minnesota and the judicial system uh, in these spaces. And I'm working along with other commissioners staffing a subcommittee of the Governor's Council on Economic Expansion devoted to every Minnesota achieving their full health potential, including behavioral health and we're talking to behavioral health experts uh, there as well about what we can do to help Minnesotans achieve their full health potential, including their behavioral health. Next slide. And so our commitment uh, would be to apply the entire capacity of the Department of Human Services over the next three years, moving Minnesota's mental health, substance use disorder, and opioid addiction services to whole new levels and supporting more Minnesotans to live full lives in communities across our state instead of the three years that it would take to create a new agency. Thank you very much for your time and attention today. Thank you, Commissioner Herbstad. Thank you for being here. Um, I, I'll, I see we've got one hand up from Commissioner Mueller. I'll take hers. And then what I'd like to do is I also want to, uh, I have a test fire of mine. I want to hit mine for real briefly and then open up for a broader discussion to Representative Mueller. Um, thank you, Chair Fisher. I can wait until you present everything and then ask my question at the end. Okay, super. Thank you. Uh, what I'll do is I'll pivot over to my uh, bill, which is House File uh, 4534. And this was coming out as taking a look at uh, you know, from the broader vision is how can we better coordinate things across uh, the different divisions, as I was uh, mentioning uh, before, between higher ed, education, et cetera. And the bill I had out here was saying that there'd be a special person, a advisor of behavioral health appointed to the commissioner to help work on these type of things and bring it out. And since this came out, I want to say thank you as Representative Stevenson has been giving a lot of input on his. I've had a lot of great input come in from on my bill 
Uh, one of it is uh, suggesting that we take a look, uh, tweak it so it's using the model that has been used for the drive towards zero death here in our state, where they're working between different departments where you've got an overall uh, person bringing things together, where they've got their own web page out there to help educate people what to be done, who do you go to, et cetera. Um, so that's what we're trying to do is taking a look at that bigger, bigger thing is how do we move our system forward and make sure that it's coordinated between all the uh, different departments we have out there. We've already heard from Commissioner Harpstad how she's already working doing that work is reaching out in these different areas. So this is where some of it's going. Uh, as I said, we've opened up, I'm, I'm very open. I know Representative Stevenson is, is continuing these discussions in this space as we have on many other issues here in this uh, division. And with that, I do know I have a testifier and I would like to uh, invite uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Sarah Erickson to testify. And keep in mind, we've got less than 10 minutes here. So I do wanna leave some time for questions out there. Thank you, Ms. Erickson. Go ahead and introduce yourself and who you're with. Mr. Chair and committee members, my name is Sarah Erickson and I'm here today representing the Coalition of Recovery Investment. I'll keep my remarks brief. We have submitted a letter that outlines um, some um, options that we see for this bill. But first, we really appreciate the committee's commitment to work on behavioral health issues. You have really thoughtful, smart discussions about incredibly important topics and you build and find consensus on policy. Um, there are a number of proposals that are being discussed around how to better address behavioral health issues in our communities at the legislature and at DHS. All of these have merit and we appreciate the robust discussion. Corey's, gold, Corey's goals in this are fourfold. One is to increase access. Two is to oversee and coordinate, identify all funding sources that are coming into the state, counties, nonprofits, for-profits, et cetera. Progress in adopting evidence-based practices, including identifying programs that and services that no longer work and we should be and we should get rid of. Finally, and most importantly, they need to be able to coordinate between different state agencies. They also need to work with the communities that are affected. They need to work with the healthcare industry and the providers that offer this service. And we need to offer best practices. But most importantly, whether this is a special advisor or whatever we ultimately call it, they must have authority to take action. And they must have the resources to solve these problems that are identified. We'll work with any group who is interested in pursuing this and welcome the discussion and thank the chair and the committee for their work. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Erickson. I see you've got a couple of hands up, so I'll open it up at this time. We'll start with Representative Muller and then go to Representative Baker. Representative Muller, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm really glad um, that you're shining a light on this and appreciate both you and um, Representative Stevenson coming up with a couple different proposals here. Um, you know, I don't know what the right solution is. I think everybody's trying to figure that out. Um, I, you know, I do know about the Medicaid issue that the commissioner um, talked about. I am concerned about um, pulling that out of human services to create a separate agency for that reason. I know NAMI has some concerns about doing that as well. Um, one of the things though I was thinking about as some of the testifiers were speaking, um, Mr. Anderson, I know you do really great work. I know all of you do really great work. I mean, you were talking about some of the communication issues. And then I was thinking of some, in some other areas we've created an ombudsperson. Um, just, I'm wondering if that's been explored or I was also thinking about with Ms. London testifying and um, some of the things she was requesting that we have the children's, the governor has a children's cabinet to address all kinds of issues related to children, something in, along that line as well. So I'm just wondering if there's somebody that can, um, maybe, there, maybe this isn't a question, but if somebody can address some of those other options if they've been explored. Uh, thank you, Ms. 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 Uh, Representative Muller. Uh, we'll see if, uh, uh, if anyone has ideas for what, what has been out there. I know these are very good suggestions. I was wondering, uh, Commissioner Harpstad, are you aware of any, what else might be happening along those lines or has been tried or? Um, well, I uh, simply want to say that we're certainly in consultation with the governor's office about all the feedback we've gotten um, as some of these bills have come forward and talking about all the possibilities of interactions between uh, the governor's office and DHS and our fellow commissioners and how to organize across state government, not just uh, how to organize DHS and uh, listening and learning and continuing to explore all the possibilities. Thank you, Commissioner Herbstad. Uh, Representative Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and, and members. I, 
I really enjoy having this conversation. I think it's important that we continue this challenge and, and this challenging um, uh, process. I remember 15 years ago or so, and I might be dating myself, but I remember uh, even longer than that, I remember back in the day when Paul Wellstone was such an outlier when he was talking about mental health. And I was thinking the guy was not all there. I have done a complete 180 and I've done this a number of years ago, just seeing all the issues. And I'm one of my most proudest things hanging on my wall is the Paul Wellstone Advocacy Award from the Minnesota Psychiatric Society. And I, it means a lot to me because I think this committee, Mr. Chair, that you, you, you know, this is the first time I think this committee has existed in the legislature. And I think if it were to exist again next year, it should be a finance committee as well. Now, I, I do also say that I, I support Commissioner Harpstead and the work that she's been doing. I think she's doing yeoman's work. She's trying to tear apart the apartment. She's trying to get things right. So I think she's got a, a very valid uh, concern if we, if we go too far too quickly and all those things. But just members, just look at where we've come to. And I think we we're recognizing the stigma of this thing has come a long way and we continue to walk this. I think someday this could be a separate uh, 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 commissioner and, and a department, but, but I don't know if, if today is a day, but I appreciate the bill coming forward. I appreciate having these honest conversations about, well, what if? And I think that this is the kind of thing we should work on. So it's just more of a comment that I'm looking forward to having more conversations about this and like to be engaged in it. So I just want to thank everybody for being here at the table with open minds. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Baker. You, you articulated it very well. Uh, Representative Frankie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to all the testifiers. Um, you know, something hit me at a point because uh, what Mr. Magnuson said, and I really appreciate it um, because it's something that I say all the time, but there for the grace of God go I, because I've been there and uh, it, it's hard. And, and, and as you and I have had, many discussions, Mr. Chair, about how do we address these issues? Because so many different things intersect within our agencies that could be solved as a result of helping people out of addiction or dealing with mental health issues. First, I wanna start by thanking Commissioner Harp said, and, and as Representative Baker said, yeoman's work right now. I mean, um, the job that they are doing in this unprecedented time um, coming out of COVID with all the fentanyl and methamphetamine coming across our borders right now. I mean, honestly, I see it every day on the streets and, and uh, it's, it's just mind blowing. So I have voiced my concerns to you and I'll voice them here on, on these potential options um, of creating a new agency. Whether we need it or not, or, or whether it has to happen, or it happens down the road, my biggest and number one concern is people falling through the cracks. When government decides to set up brand new agencies or split off into different um, sections, people need to be our number one concern and making sure that they can still at minimum receive the quality of services we are providing now. Um, our, our number one goal is to provide better services and, and make them more available and have more options. But um, I think we need to have baby steps right now um, and, and doing this work to make sure it gets done right. Um, as I've stated before, when it comes to the 3086, um, this isn't Minlars. Um, if somebody can't get their driver's license or their car tabs, it is not gonna kill them. But if somebody cannot get their, I, I, don't, I don't even know how to say it. It just kind of, it, it worries me. It worries me that if we can't provide the services or they fall through the cracks, people, people could die. Um, they, they will stay on the streets. They will continue to use. And, and, and that's worrisome for me. So um, just two questions maybe, and then we'll move on. I know we're running short on time. Yeah, we're real short. Where does the governor stand on this? Uh, I don't know if he, uh, if he has a position. Uh, uh, Commissioner Harpstad, does the governor have any kind of position on this at, at this point? 
Um, he and I are uh, talking constantly, uh, Chair Fisher and members, about uh, the best ways to organize uh, state government, the best ways to organize DHS. I think you can see where the governor stands from the governor's revised supplemental budget proposals that support these services in this area. And uh, we're continuing to talk, especially as we come out of COVID, about how we should organize to best move these things forward. And Representative Frankie, I'm going to have to cut off here because we've got like less than a minute left here. So. What well, I would thank say you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. I appreciate it. I just think that you know this needs some serious discussion. I I definitely agree, and I want to thank everybody for for being here and be part of this discussion. Uh, Representative Stevenson, testifiers, thank you for uh, helping move this discussion forward. It's one that I know that from the uh, your side of the aisle, uh, Representative Frankie, Representative Baker, you folks have got strong commitment on it. Uh, are very interested in figuring out how do we do this better. And this is something that. As I said earlier, this is just the start of it. We all have the vision before we wanna go down the road. And these are just the start of the discussions that will continue to move us in this in this direction. Something that uh, we're starting now, we'll continue to work on. It's not gonna end overnight. It's not gonna end at the end of the session, but something that is gonna continue on in the years to come uh, so that we have better ways to address the issues here in our state. Uh, with that, I wanna thank everybody for being part of that. And then seeing this is probably our last meeting, and I know that we're now running over, so I'm gonna be extremely quick on this, is uh, I, I appreciate everybody's hard work. I, I appreciate the way that we've uh, approached the issues here. Uh, we've had good discussions. There has been no partisanship in here. This has been hardworking Minnesotans getting together to figure out how do we best address the issues out there. I'd like to thank our staff that has been supporting us from all sides. We have Barry LaGrave, uh, Spencer Kroos, David Sullivan, Sarah Sunderman, Chris McCall, Harry Kennedy, uh, Lindsay Hansen. Thank you all for your work and support out there. Lead Frankie, I want to say thank you for all the effort that you've been putting in, working on the bills in joint with us, helping provide us the input as we're going forward. And um, just want to say it's been an honor, and I think that it's been a real testament to that there's a lot of work in our state that happens and that helps Minnesotans that happens in a very bipartisan way that sometimes gets missed. I think the way that uh, you folks have led on your side and we have led on our side shows that when we have tough issues out there, we can come together and get a lot of great work done. And with that, I want to say thank you to everyone. We are over time and uh, hope you folks all have a great day. And once again, thank you for all the work that we've been doing here and look forward to continuing working together. Bye-bye. <laughs>